Wow, I am actively impressed to see this many wonderful humans here. I know I'm so, imp I'm like looking at all of you because you all get brownie points for being here, but I will be totally transparent. There are no course points associated with the things I am going to talk about today. Um, if that makes your brain immediately check out, I'm sorry. But mostly I just didn't want to give you another homework assignment. And I felt like we needed to be done with exercise seven. So there's no course points associated with today's lecture or Friday's lecture. Um, in fact, this topic that we're gonna go on today usually does not exist in 373. It exists in my version of 373 because I think that there's a lot of things that you should understand about how computers fundamentally work to be a good programmer. And they literally will not teach it to you anywhere else. The stuff that I'm gonna talk about here is mostly contained within, I would say, EE271, maybe 470? 374 definitely does not. Um, and then I was gonna say, and CSE 351. Those are the, like, if you were gonna do this stuff. So if you like the stuff, there it does exist more, but I think those courses are ones that, well, they're majors only courses, so if you know, you're not in either of those majors, it's a little less accessible. Um, and also, I think they're fun, it's fun. Okay. I changed them to apples. <laughs> um, okay, so let's actually talk about some stuff you do care about before you take your 45 minute nap. Um, all right, so I'm assuming you saw, thank you Rahul for posting, but we have officially posted the in-person final exam scores. The, uh, here is our percentages. It was higher scoring generally than the midterm, like congrats everyone, grading went really smoothly. Like I think overall my takeaway is that hopefully it was a better fit exam, both because you knew what we were asking for and maybe our exam was written a little bit better. So shout out to the TAs for doing a wonderful job there. Uh, so here's the distribution in case you're curious. Um, it will, will have the same rules apply to the resubmission. The only changes is that this time uh, we are opening the regrade requests for the in-person grades sooner. In fact, they're already open. I was gonna say, I saw some already in there. So right now you have access to your in-person final exam grades. If you think there was a mistake in the original grades, you can submit a regrade request on the original in-person stuff. But you also have your resubmission that is now open and will be due a week from today, Wednesday, June 7th. I need every piece of material that you want me to consider for your GPA by Wednesday, June 7th, 1159. Literally Thursday the next day, the TAs and I are like, like quarantining ourselves in a room and we're gonna finish all of the grading. So if there's something else, like uh, there will be the option to get, uh, to submit regrade requests for exercise seven. Um, I heard there was a little bit of a confusion about the due date for that. And I was like, ah, screw it. It's the last day of the, or last week of the quarter, whatever. It's due technically tonight now, whatever, just to make sure that's easy. Uh, and then we will re submit our release uh, grades for exercise seven this weekend. We will immediately open regrade requests. You'll have a shorter regrade period for that just because it's the end of the quarter. Uh, but so I need your final exam resubmission. I need your P4 and I need your exercise seven regrade requests. I need all of that by Wednesday. Please, please remember you cannot use late days on P4. You might be like, Casey, that's not fair but it's because if I was being true to the patterns, I would have made it due on Friday, and then you would have had to use your late days, but I decided, screw it, I'll just make the late submission the last possible time I could accept things from you. That's why you can't use late days. I just literally need everything from you by Wednesday, June 7th. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, shout about it on the ed board. I want to make sure everybody knows that. That's the one date we all can't slip, unfortunately. Um, does anyone have any course administrative questions? Nothing? Yes? Same thing where you get half your points back? Yes, it'll be the same thing where you get, like, you can 
Resubmit just the questions you want to resubmit. We will take the higher of the two scores per question, and then you will get one final computed resubmission score, and we will average that with your in-person score. And then to know what your like final, final grade is, look at the percentage earned on Canvas. So if you look at the midterm percentage on Canvas, that's what you got you know, at the end of the day by averaging those two things. And there will be a new one for final. Yes? Like the GPAs, the yeah. GPAs. Will that be like adjusted based on like the math or will it be on a curve? Oh, is it on a curve? Okay, I'm gonna be as transparent as I can be about this. The answer is kinda. Um, and so here's how I work it. I know I put those like minimum sort of like you must get this percentage to get this GPA on the syllabus. Hopefully you have all recognized that those are under promises, meaning if you get exactly the percentage I say needed to get a 3.5, which I want to say is like a 95%, yeah. chances are if you get a 95%, you will get a higher grade than 3.5. But I did those so that I can guarantee you something. And then the way that I apply the curve is that I make sure I keep my promises on cross all of those, and then I just drag everyone's GPA up to what I am allowed to make as the highest possible overall GPA average in this class, which is 3-2. So I put everybody to that curve, I see what you get, and if the overall class average is under 3-2, then I just kind of pull everybody up. So the answer is, is that the curve's already applied by those buckets. So for example, technically your performance is not going to hurt anyone's grade but the curve may help some folks more than others. Because for example, I am more likely to pull more folks up from say a 2.9 to a 3.0. I will pull fewer folks up from a 3.9 to a 4.0. And the, so the, the curve just applies in how I pull you upwards. And so you're less likely to get a boost up near the top because I just can't have as many 4.0s as I could have 2.0s, for example. But I promise you will get at least that minimum GPA. I know that's complicated, but that is the authentic system. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Okay, so the 4.0 is a tough answer, question to answer. Um, once upon a time, before the pandemic, uh, I gave the same type of exam every single quarter, and I could tell you the answer was 96%. But ever since, I have been changing the way we do the assessments, and this is the first time we've ever done this type of assessment either, so I don't know how that's going to impact it. But in the before times, the 4.0 line was usually somewhere between 96 and 98. I would guess it's still somewhere in that order of magnitude, but I don't, that one's the hardest one. That one will probably change up until I finalize the GPAs. The 4.0 line is sort of the most the most sensitive, as you can imagine. The 2.0 line, I can do a little bit more with. Yeah. So they're great. Thank you. I forgot to put it on here. Um, I, I made a post on Ed and emailed you all yesterday. But so tomorrow for section, the TAs have agreed uh, to just turn that into office hours. So that means that there are office hours tomorrow, literally from 8.30 a.m. all the way till 4.20 p.m. And we are not doing any office hours after Friday the 2nd. So if you are not pretty gosh darn close to being done with P4, maybe tomorrow is the day that you go on a marathon of office hours. Uh, we will still answer questions via ed, but our TAs are also students. And so as you can imagine, they're gonna be studying for their own finals and doing that sort of stuff, which is why we won't be holding office hours after Friday, um, but we will still try to answer your questions via the ed board. Anything else? Cool. Okay, 
Um, I made a Slido active. I don't know if this format works, but uh, so today I'm going to talk about, like I said, memory and locality for the reasons that I sort of mentioned at the top here. Um, on Friday, I'm going to be doing a roundup of like what comes after 373, what other courses should I take, what if I want to get into the tech industry, blah, blah, blah. There's a bunch of topics I could talk about in there. Uh, rank them and I will adjust the lecture according to what you want. Also, if you have any open questions, feel free to drop them in the Slido Q&A or go in and upvote those. Um, I am happy to try and cater to make sure that I am spending that last Friday giving you whatever resources you as a group want. So even if you are watching this on Panopto, uh, the Slido should be open and I will probably make those adjustments up until Friday afternoon. So feel free to answer those things appropriately. Okay, cool. Let's talk about some computer stuff. All right. So um, I think one of the incredible, fantastical aspects of computers is that technically everything in a computer comes down to a one or zero. And I am an electrical engineering major, and what that means is literally whether you let electricity pass through a gate or you don't let it pass through a gate. We call those gates transistors. Uh, the semiconductive material is what decides whether or not you let electricity pass through and that circuit is completed or you block that electricity and the circuit's not completed. If it helps, you can think of it like a light switch. On connects the circuit and the lights go on. Off breaks the flow of electricity and the lights go off. That is exactly how we store information in the computer. We store it in the form of binary, where a one represents the light switch on and the zero represents the light switch off. Uh, this is a breakdown in case you haven't encountered binary, I'm not really going to go over it, to show how we can still represent more complicated data than simply a one or zero, but using a combination of multiple ones or zeros. So you can see when we have just a singular bit, meaning we have place for just one number, that value can either be one or zero meaning it can just hold those two values. That's how that works, as you can see here. But if we, say, give ourselves four bits, well, then we can store the number zero, the number one, the number two, the number three, blah, 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 so far and so. And it's all based on how we translate these four light switches to be either, yes, we include this number one on, or zero, no, we don't include that number off. Making space in memory for these little light switches, that's, that's what we're doing today. How do we store all of these, whether these light switches are on and off, in the most efficient and densely packed way possible to make this data as easily accessible to us as possible? Really, that's our goal. Okay, so here's a thought experiment. Look at these two pieces of code. And I will tell you right now, if you look closely, these two pieces of code look almost identical. Can anyone look at these two pieces of code and tell me the one difference? What is the one change between these two pieces of code? Yes, please. Exactly. So there is only two character difference. This one, as you can see, does the outer for loop as sort of the rows, and the inner for loop as the columns, versus this does the outer for loop as the columns, and this does them as the rows. Now, I say rows and columns in terms of a two-dimensional array. Well, that's how we usually draw a two-dimensional array, is like a matrix, and we've got rows and columns. Uh, what is the runtime? of these, I think I left it on the slide here. You can see it's n times m, where n is the number of rows and m is the number of columns. Uh, are these two pieces of code in the same complexity class? Are they both O of n times n? Yeah. So we would probably expect that this code takes roughly the same amount of time to run. Isn't that what we've been doing? For 10 weeks, Casey's been like, well, we don't care about the constants. We just care about the complexity class. That's what matters, right? If you can see here, 
these are two different graphs. There is a blue line that sits pretty gosh darn close down to the x-axis. That is the runtime of sum one, where we go, as you can see here, rows and then columns. That angry red one <laughs> is the runtime of sum two, where we go columns and then rows. But they're in the same complexity class. I'm going to spend today talking about why those two things happen and explaining those angry spikes, especially this one right here. That one's really upset. Um, and what's caused there. I think I already told you a little bit about this uh, throughout the course, but we're really going to get specific about it for the rest of this lecture. Okay. This is actually a slide I showed you before. I just carried it over. So here's more run times of this. Uh, if you want to take a closer look, this is kind of for you to read later. But more examples of if we actually clock run times. There's a bunch of these angry spikes, and even though things are supposed to be in the same complexity class, they seem to run at different times. Like, why is this? Why is the theory not necessarily perfectly translating to reality? So it comes from these assumptions that I absolutely told you to make. I told you you had to make these assumptions. Um, these are the assumptions you make when we do that sort of asymptotic analysis. One, that accessing memory is quick and constant time and always equal. That the time it takes to get to one specific element of an array is exactly the same regardless of which array and which column and which row, et cetera. Um, sometimes accessing memory is just straight up cheaper, faster, easier than in other times. Sometimes accessing memory is really gosh darn slow. And I'm going to talk about why those things are. Yeah, great, thanks. OK, so um, let's get in a little bit more specifics. Uh, so I'm going to guess most of you have heard the term RAM before, kind of used generally to reference like, oh, how smart your computer is. Uh, just so you actually have a working definition of it, RAM is the working memory of your computer. It stands for random access memory. It's the memory that your computer uses for all actively in-process tasks. So every time you open up a new program, let's say you've got your web browser, you've got your Spotify, you've got your calculator, maybe you've got a Word doc, all of those things that you have active and running at any one singular given time are all partitioned extra little sections of your RAM. And each of those has a container around it. For example, when you're running IntelliJ, the reason that when you say get an stack overflow error or you hit an infinite loop, the reason that it throws an exception and fails instead of taking over the entire memory of your computer is because we sort of know, hey, we don't want any one program to just be able to take up all the memory. We kind of put these limits. We put these containers around programs because they all live in the same memory space. And if you want to continue on, you know, and do assembly, and I think I do a, I do a little of this in 374. I don't know how much the other professors do. You can talk about what happens or if programs accidentally leak outside of their allowed program frame. You can get some weird stuff. But if you're ever curious, that thing on the right-hand side, that's your sort of like system log. Like you, I think I maybe even had to do it one time during this class. If like PowerPoint crashes and you got to force exit it. You open up that. Those are all of the programs running our computer. What that really just is a list of all the things competing for space in the RAM. I would guess most of your computers have 8 gigs of RAM, maybe 16, because we live in the future right now. Um, but that's, I like to sort of think of RAM as like my conscious working memory. You know, like how many tasks can I do at once? How good of a multitasker are you? That's what the RAM's really handling within your computer. It's just a giant array. That's all it is. As it turns out, every single thing in your computer from everything that's happening in Spotify and everything that's happening in your Word doc and everything that's happening in your calculator or in your web browser, all of it is getting translated down to a collection of ones and zeros that are technically stored in hexadecimal format as memory addresses in this giant array. In each of those hexadecimals, they could represent the value in a variable. They could represent uh, where to find a song. They could represent the name of a file, anything. It's all translated to just a bunch of numbers stored in this array called the RAM. Great. That's why, and this is a slide you have seen before, uh, 
That's why when we were first learning this, we talked about this concept of contiguous versus non-contiguous memory. We're now talking about within the landscape of the RAM, the operating system, it's the operating system's job to go into that big array of RAM and be like, ooh, okay, so like I'm gonna partition this part for playing a song and like, ooh, this part I'll hear, there's a nice empty open space, that's gonna be for running your IntelliJ program, so on and so forth. They're sort of like, for lack of a better term, they're the realtor of your RAM, right? They're like, oh, here's an open lot, boom, sold to Spotify, for example. Now, the operating system is also responsible for going in and cleaning up that memory as it is no longer in use. And you as the programmer do not have control over how the operating system partitions the memory in RAM when you're working in Java. Java is a memory managed language. But if we can understand that this is what's happening, we can intelligently write our code so that the operating system will make better choices. And one of the classic examples of that is array versus linked list. So if I had an array of numbers and I wanted to start at index zero and sum them all up, and if I had a linked list of numbers and I wanted to start at the first node and sum them all up, it would be again in the same complexity class, the linear complexity class. However, what's happening under the hood is an array is always gonna try and partition memory that's all right next to each other in the RAM, which makes it really nice and fast to get from one box of memory to the other. We kind of already know this is where we're looking. It's actually got the sort of specific stack frame pointer that it's keeping track of versus when I do a linked list, I only partition enough memory per object and then I can link between the different places in memory. But every single time I follow one of those arrows, What's actually happening underneath the, underneath the Java in the assembly code is a jump. And a jump command is always gonna take the most amount of time out of all of the sort of assembly instructions. And so for that reason, even though these two things would probably end up like these two make a new array and fill it up, make a new list and fill it up, same complexity class, you, if you were to run them, the graph would look gosh darn similar to that one I showed you at the start of lecture, where in the array, it just looks almost flat down the x-axis, but then in the linked list, it's like angry and spiky, because some of those spikes are following one of those arrows to find the next location of memory, jumping around to different chips within the RAM. So this is one of the reasons that arrays become so gosh darn popular. Our computer is essentially just a big array. So using arrays, our computer is really well optimized to interact with arrays. So you will find a lot of the times people choose the array implementation of any data structure for this exact reason. Even sometimes if the complexity class is not as good. Because sometimes it will still perform better at the scale you're talking about because of the constant coefficients gained by contiguous memory. Any questions about this? I sort of expect this a bit review, but this is such an important concept. Great, okay, now let's talk about things other than RAM. So there's a lot of different places in your computer that store data. Now you can kind of think of them as sort of like proximity to where the action's gonna happen. And so the action in your computer is technically happening in the CPU, the central processing unit, but that action has to be so fast that there's almost no actual storage there. All that's stored there is like 32 bits, which I kind of like to think of in my little analogy here to, I wanna eat an apple. That's the equivalent of like maybe how much space you have on your plate and maybe the time it takes you to move from eating one thing to picking up the apple on the other side of your plate and eating that, it's like, right at hand, it's most accessible, it's ready for you, it's like staged for you to bite into that apple, right? That's the fastest data is gonna transfer between those locations in memory called registers. It is the smallest amount of storage. Your plate is the smallest. Then the computer actually has two separate spaces of memory between the CPU and the RAM, because the RAM can be pretty big. Eight gigs, 16 gigs is pretty big. We got a lot of computers these days. 
And so traveling through that giant forest is actually kind of time expensive. And so the computer will try to anticipate the data that you need and preload it into these things called caches that sit closer, physically closer to the CPU. Now the one that's the most physically close to the CPU gives us the fastest time to get data out of it because now we are absolutely talking about data limitation based on the speed of light. Because the speed of light is how fast it takes electrons to move through the wires of your computer. So the L1 cache, if we want that to be the next fastest bit of access to data, it has to be physically the closest in proximity. It's got to have the least amount of physical distance for those electrons to travel. So I kind of like to think of the caches as like your refrigerator. Like it's in your house. You just kind of got to go over and get it. And it's kind of like you've intentionally went out and maybe you know what you're going to make this week. You kind of went out and pre-planned it. You went grocery shopping on Sunday or something. You don't want to go out to the grocery store every single time you want to eat a meal, right? Like you kind of drive out one time, you get what you need for the week, and you pre-stage it in your refrigerator. There's actually two caches traditionally, the L1 and the L2 cache. As you can see, the L2 cache a little further away, but more memory. There's a little bit of a waterfall system here. And then maybe the RAM, you could kind of think about that as like the store. Like it's going to take you a while to like get in your car and like drive out to the store. And so you don't want to do that constantly. But there's a lot more food at the store <laughs> than there could physically be in your refrigerator. And so, you know, here that's maybe eight gigs of RAM and that takes you 100 nanoseconds to go out and get something all the way in RAM and take it all the way back to the CPU. So you want to do that not as commonly. And then finally, we come to what we might refer to as the disk. That is the thing that actually like may physically be spinning in your computer because it actually is like a physical disk where they've made laser incisions on the disk to indicate those ones and zeros. And as it spins, that's how we get the information out of it. It's also very hot. Because of all that friction of the spinning, that heat makes it a really dangerous thing to have close to your CPU. So it, to keep the brain functioning well has got to be as far away as possible. But it is designed to store the most. And because it is laser cuts on that disk, you might not have like actual disks. There's a lot of different ways of hardware, but roll with me right here. On that disk, because we've made actual incisions, it will still store data even if your computer's not turned on. So when you turn your computer off and you've got your files of your pictures and all of your ho homework and maybe you've stored some music and maybe you've actually downloaded programs and things like that, all of that information is kind of like cold storage and that's in the disk of your computer. When you open up that video game that you've downloaded, the operating system goes out to disk, grabs its data and pulls the operating data into RAM. But that takes a while. That's why sometimes, for example, if you're starting up a really complicated video game, you know, it takes a long time on startup. It's going and getting a bunch of data from the disk and pulling it into the RAM. And then as you're like, you know, clicking around and playing with stuff, it's constantly taking things from the RAM and slowly feeding them into the cache and into the CPU. As the caches fill up, they kind of boot stuff back to the RAM. And then when you turn your computer off, the RAM washes, but the disk stays. Yes. Yes. It, so that's one of the, you might, you might have solid state drives now, a lot of you in your computers. Um, so they don't do this anymore. And frankly, I don't know enough about that technology, but once upon a time you did have a spinning thing that was constantly cutting these little things in it. Uh, once upon a time when some people were in high school, the most romantic thing in the world was to make a burned CD for somebody. But because we were students, we would just trade CDs back and forth. You could only burn a CD so many times because you were physically making burn marks in the CD. That was kind of what was happening in the spinning disk. You could only cut so many times into it before the thing's like, I can't hold any more data, you gotta throw this one out. 
Technically, the same thing is happening with magnetic tape. If you all maybe, how many people have physically touched a cassette tape? Okay, that makes me feel a little better. <laughs> uh, similar thing, they were applying electromagnets to sort of move things within the physical tape. The physical tape can only be re-recorded over so many times, um, so on and so forth. So, this little Apple analogy here, um, I, should, I, I need to go and steal that other professor's actual timings, but the time it takes you to sort of reach across the plate and get the Apple, it's about equivalent to this free time, this like, you know, it's already on your plate. But the time that it takes to go out to the disk, you can think of comparatively to that apple on the plate is the time it takes to plant a seed in the ground, wait for a tree to sprout up and then grow apples and then pick it and drive them all the way in. Like eight million nanoseconds compared to free. That's the difference of magnitude we're talking about. The time it takes to grow trees. We're talking years. So going out to disk is really expensive comparatively. Also, like going out to the store, really expensive compared to going just to your refrigerator. So how do we decide what goes in what and what gets pulled into the L1 cache? That's what we're going to talk about next. Yeah. What an interesting and well-timed question, if you bring a lot of stuff. And so, for example, let's say we are driving all the way out to go you pick or something at some you pick Apple place. It would be pretty silly to go drive all the way out to whatever beautiful Woodenville place, pick a single apple, and then drive that single apple home. You're like, I'm already out here. I'm going to fill this bushel, right? There's a name for it. So uh, here's the takeaways uh, before I get into this next piece. Uh, the further away you are from the CPU, the more memory, the bigger that thing is, but the more time it takes to get out there. Um, so we are impacted by physics, the speed of light, physical closeness to the CPU, cost. As you can imagine, physical pieces of your computer that have more transistors, more densely packed, more expensive. Things that produce less heat and thus stay in a more stable state, more expensive. So it's always a balance, and this is a good one, a balance between how high-powered that feature is versus the cost. Speed and space, good enough, all that stuff, right. Okay, so let's talk about locality. So the operating system's main goal is to maximize any of those actions of going and retrieving data. It wants to reduce the number of times it has to go do that, and when it absolutely has to go do that, it wants to make sure that it's grabbing the most useful pieces of information possible. So one of the ways that it does that is with essentially what our friend asked about, something we refer to as spatial locality. That is another reason that the arrays perform so, so much better than the linked lists because the operating system will look at the RAM and if you ask for, let's say, one element of an array, when the operating system goes in and finds that element of an array, it already has a certain amount of space to transfer data. You can kind of think of it as like your car. Like your car has a certain size of trunk. And it would be pretty silly to drive all the way out to Woodenville, pick a single apple, put that apple in the middle of your very empty trunk, and then drive it all the way home. But maybe you were like, oh, my trunk can like fit three bushels of apples, so I'm always going to get three bushels of apple. If you only really wanted one apple, you're still going to hedge your bets and try and fill up the rest of your trunk, maybe run some other errands or something and like pack as much in there so you don't have to drive over to the east side again. Who knows? Whatever you're going to do, right? So what the computer does, and it's equivalent, is if you ask for one index of an array, it's like, oh, well, if this data is in an array, it's probably related to all the other data in an array. And chances are, if you ask for one index of the array, you're probably going to ask for another index of that array at other point. Maybe you ask for index zero, and the computer doesn't know it's in a loop, but chances are you're going to loop through the rest of the indices. So what it does is it grabs all of the data stored within that array because it is literally just stored low, like close by. 
spatial locality. It is localized into a specific space. It's like, oh, it's all stored generally in the same area. It must all be related. And if you ask for one piece, you're probably going to ask for another. And so it fills up its trunk with all of the stuff that's kind of co-located, and then it drives it in. So when I say it drives it in, maybe that data is in the RAM. Maybe that data is in the disk. I don't know. But it's going to drive it closer up to the CPU, probably initially to the L1 cache if it'll all fit. Then it'll sit in the L1 cache and wait until the CPU asks for it. So we're trying to decide what we fill our refrigerator up with so we don't have to make as many trips to the store. Temporal locality, the other type of locality here, that is the idea that we have these L1 caches and they're only so big. And so the computer is constantly trying to decide what it pulls in, but every time it pulls something in, that means it's got to evict something. So the computer says, well, if you used it recently, you're more likely to use it again soon. I think of this as that inescapable pile of clothing that always sits right next to my dresser on the chair. I only wore that sweatshirt once. I'll wear it at least two more times before I wash it so it doesn't go back into the drawer. It just kind of sits on that chair and I kind of have like a working bit of clothing that I'm kind of rotating through until it's dirty and then I like throw it in the hamper. It's like, ah, I just wore that shirt. I'll wear it like on the weekend and I'll get the most use out of it. That's kind of what's happening. So any stuff you've used most recently gets to stay in the caches and then anything that you haven't touched, it's like, you know, June and you, it's noticed you haven't touched that winter coat in a while, well, that gets jettisoned out to the RAM or to the desk because we're like, oh, well, you haven't touched that. Chances are you're not going to need it for a while. We'll let you go out and get it when the time is right. So spatial locality is the idea that whenever we go out to get data, we fill up our entire car with whatever's co-located so we don't waste any space on a trip. Temporal locality is that when we are making space in our caches, we kick out the oldest unused stuff first. We're biased towards the most recently used stuff. So that that way, we're trying to keep the stuff that we're most likely to ask for, and we're trying to pre sort of like retrieve the stuff we're most likely to ask for next. Questions? I'm probably just going to drive these things home for the next uh, 13 minutes or so. Um, OK, so uh, leveraging spatial locality. Uh, when looking up an address in the slower, you always want to bring in more than what you need. Uh, so for example, you know, like if you really only need one byte, you're not just going to put a single apple in your trunk. You're going to bring in as many bytes. Data carpool is what we think of this. Great, OK. Um, oh, um, a TA made this, and I think they're really fun. Uh, this is my cat, Iron Fist No Mercy. Um, and I, for many, many years, lived in an apartment right across from the Safeway. You all know the Safeway on uh, Brooklyn in 50th? No, it kind of was out of uh, order there for a minute. Uh, but the analogy is, let's say Mercy uh, wants a fish. Well, I got really lazy because I lived across the street from the Safeway, and maybe I went and I got a fish from the Safeway, like maybe I was at a point where I was making three or four trips to the Safeway every day because it was across the street. Um, so let's get Mercy a refrigerator. Now we can get all the fish. We don't have to take as many trips. So Safeway's the RAM. Mercy's mouth is the CPU. The refrigerator's the cache. There we go. Cool. And there is the uh, description from said TA once upon a time. You can read it. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Zach. Wonderful. OK, so how much memory is actually taken from RAM? Uh, so it does depend on your computer and how it is built. But we have the concept of what we're going to refer to as a page. A page is a reference to how much data you will bring in from the disk. And actually, as it turns out, one of the lectures I cut from this course, because everybody decided that they're boring, but I get that 332 makes you feel that way, uh, is B trees. It's a specific type of structure where each node of the tree is designed to be the exact same size as however big your data carpool is, however big a page of data is. And so there actually exist data structures that are built explicitly where each node is the full size of one of those data carpools. So that every time you try to access that node, you get a whole node at one time. 
great. Um, you can read through these things. Cool. Um, there we go. Lots of stuff. I'll let you read these things. Okay, let's come back to this piece of it now. Um, okay, so we've got some one and some two. Some one, the way it's going to work is we are going to start where i is going to become zero, and then j is going to go zero, one, two, and then we'll loop again. And so the way that sum one works is this is a probably more accurate representation of a two-dimensional array. I know we usually draw them as matrices because that makes our lives easier as humans, but this is a little more specific as to what's happening versus index zero of the outer array stores that entire inner array. And so sum one, the way that that kind of works is it's like it jumps into this index zero and then it jumps and it goes zero, one, two. And then it goes to this index one and then it goes zero, one, two. And then it goes to this index two, zero, one, two. And then this index three, zero, one, two. This index zero, one, two. So that's sum one. Sum two, what it's going to do is it's going to come index zero and grab this index zero. And then it's going to come to this index one and grab this index zero. And then they're grabbed into this index two and grab this index zero. And then grab three, zero, four, zero. And then it'll come back and it'll go zero, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, and so on. So when we were looking at that graph of sum one versus sum two, what do we think was possibly contributing to sum one operating so much more quickly in terms of the localities? Yes. Yes, exactly. So this is the classic canonic example of how spatial, spatial locality helps. This is probably not a temporal locality thing because it's like happening within the same program and like the stuff within the same program is all kind of hanging out probably in the caches for a while. But this is exactly why because with the spatial locality, I'm processing this entire inner array at one time and so I'm keeping all of this stuff. But if I was jumping from each of these arrays over, what might be happening is that that data between each of these arrays might be getting kicked out to the L2 or the RAM at some point as I'm running. Because also keep in mind, like there's a lot of things competing for your L1 cache space, especially if you're listening to music and also taking notes and like going on the internet and also as somebody in the Chrome org, man, does Chrome eat your memory. <laughs> um, why does it eat your memory? Because it's doing massive amounts of data collection and data processing behind the scenes. That's why. That's why it's the most expensive web browser, because it's doing the most data collection and analysis. There you go. Um, and why is it doing the most data collection analysis? Because Google has the most data collected about you as an individual, and it is constantly pairing that with your web browser and your web activity. So it is constantly doing accesses to the cloud to pull in data that it already knows about you and combine it and like mash it into your RAM so that it can decide which ads to eventually show you. That's why Chrome is such a powerful and also terrifying web browser. But it's still my favorite, I'm not gonna lie. I use it, whatever. Oh, <laughs> <should> use Edge. <laughs> Okay, I'm just like off book right now, but I was at Microsoft when we invented Edge. Just so you know, Edge is literally Internet Explorer with a rebrand. It's the same code base. They threw out about 30% of the code base. I think probably about 50% of the code base is different now, but they just realized they couldn't change the perception of it, so they just reskinned it. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> Corporate America. Um, yeah, also technically Skype is just link. That's also another one. Um, so what's happening here is exactly spatial locality. We're going to process the entirety of an array before we move on. And so this is a classic example of though this programmer who wrote sum two cannot impact the way that the data is actually stored in memory at all, being aware that we want to process the entirety of a singular array before moving on to the next array will dramatically speed up our code. Also two, temporal locality. Anytime you're storing data or using data, try to deal with it all around the same time within your program. You know, sometimes it's not possible, but for example, you'll notice a lot of people when they're doing file processing, instead of like 
doing some amount of, like maybe they you know need to count the words at one point and then they need to count the letters and then they need to count names or something like that you'll notice people tend to do all of the file processing all at once store it in a bunch of variables and then they move on because otherwise every time they have to access the file files cannot be stored in RAM. They're almost always stored in disk. So anytime you're doing any Java programming that's referencing a text file or referencing some file you got to go out to, you're using the file IO stuff. That's one of those you got to plant a tree and wait for the apple to blossom kind of things. So if you're doing any type of large data processing, do it all at once and then don't have to go back to the file. That's the way to leverage temporal locality. This is the example of how to leverage spatial. I think, yes. Um, this is all just stuff that I think, I guess we could maybe talk about this for a hot second. Is there anything interesting in here? So yeah, just so, um, just so you know, uh, this is all about like when you're writing code, when are you actually interacting with memory? So that's also why the new keyword in Java is magic. The new keyword is Java's kind of equivalent of Malik, Alec, Kalik. The new keyword is the way that we as Java programmers say, hey, compiler, go tell the operating system to give me space in memory. If you were writing a program in C or C++, you got to go find that memory yourself. You got to specifically decide how much memory you want to set aside. You got to reallocate your pointers and you got to tell the computer when you're done with that memory. In Java, it is a memory managed language, so all you gotta do is say new, and then say what type of thing you need a new instance of, and Java will figure out how much space you need, give you a pointer, and then it will notice when you no longer use that thing, it'll free stuff up. When you look at all of this, sometimes people ask me, well, why do we do Java then? Because it sounds like Java allows memory to kind of stick along longer than we need it. It usually allocates a little extra compared to what we need. C and C++ give you such fine grain control that often you can limit the amount of memory that you'll use, which is why you'll often find C and C++ typically more hardware languages. Like the Windows operating system, that high level stuff, not the like assembly or the machine code, that's all written in C++, a little C sharp, mostly C. Um, but you wouldn't use Java to write an operating system. And I kind of liken it to driving an automatic car versus a standard car. I personally drive standard and I shift gears right when I know I need to. But whenever I drive an automatic car, I notice like you put your foot on the gas and you're like, are you gonna switch? Like what's happening here? And then, oh, it finally gets to it. Because it's sort of like erring on the side of cautious. And so it's more accessible, makes it easier for more people to be able to drive a car because you're more abstracted away from the gears. You don't have to even think about the gears. Java is like that. It was written so that more people could learn how to code. You're another level abstracted away from the memory management. Java just takes care of it for you. But because it just takes care of it for you, it's a little wasteful. Stuff sticks around a little longer than it needs to. It usually partitions a little bit more than you necessarily want it to. For the most part, if you're just writing, you know, PC applications, you're not so memory strapped, but that's totally fine. When you start moving into embedded systems and mobile applications, you care a lot more about like the right size memory at the right exact time. But for the most part, Java is a great language. I will tell you right now, uh, all Android apps are actually written in Java. Um, you can download Android Studio and write an Android app right now if you wanted. Uh, and also, Java is the language most used at most of the products at Amazon. That's their favorite language, right? Yeah. <laughs> Python, yeah. Yes? What's the difference between Java and JavaScript? So, JavaScript. JavaScript and Java actually are not related at all, but JavaScript stole the name. It's like car and carpet. That's a really good way. That's about how related they are. Um, so Java is what we would call an object-oriented, strictly typed, memory managed, compiled language. What that means is, is that an int is an int and a double is a double. They're not just random numbers. Right? Like you got to have a specific type. Memory managed meaning I can say new and I never have to free up language. Object oriented meaning I can create objects, I can define them myself. 
And then finally compiled is like, if you were using JGrasp, you used to hit the little green plus sign and it would compile and tell you your errors. IntelliJ is just doing that constantly in the back. But what that means is I could write this and then it's compiled into assembly. So the way that it gets translated from the Java to the machine code is specific and predictable across any type of computer. JavaScript is not compiled, it's interpreted, meaning it can only be applied by web browsers and the way that what you write in JavaScript will be interpreted on the screen can vary a little bit. Different web browsers interpret it in different ways. Different computers interpret it in different ways. It's not compiled. JavaScript is not strictly typed. You just write var or what's the more modern one, anyone? Thank you, yes. Um, and then you just put your data there. So it could be a string, it could be an int, it could be a double, whatever, that kind of stuff. It is not object oriented. You can define a class and a function, but you can't really create a new object. You can kind of fake it, but it's not an object oriented class. And then what was my last one? Strictly typed, compiled. It's not memory managed because JavaScript is pretty exclusively for web browsers. So it's not really about storing memory on your computer. It's more about uh, sending information back and forth on connections on the internet. That was a great question. Okay, um, I'm gonna drop it there. I'm happy to answer any other questions if you wanna stick around for a few minutes. Uh, please answer the Slido. I haven't looked at it, but I would love to see what you wanna hear about on Friday. And then hopefully I'll see a lot of you on Friday for our last lecture before summer vacation. I love that. <laughs>